Well, good morning. Thank you for coming this morning and uh, worshiping, <coughs> worshiping with us here at Southside. We're certainly glad to have you, and as we always say, we want to be blessed, and we want you to be blessed by watching and listening and, and worshiping with us today. I just do, before we get our children up here and uh, talk with them for a few minutes, just want to remind you of, of this announcement. Don't forget that tonight is our... Uh, soup supper. Six o'clock, we'll not be having preaching per se tonight, but we'll be fellowshipping together in the fellowship hall. Uh, we invite you to come and eat soup with us tonight before Thanksgiving, and those that are going to be working and serving uh, in there, you're asked to be here at five o'clock to help get things ready and to get things ready to be served. So just remind you, come and eat fellowship with us tonight. Uh, as the church family here and have a good time uh, together tonight. All right, children, y'all come on down. There you go. Hey, baby, how you doing? Okay. 
All right. Uh oh. First time. More girls than boys. There we go. Come on, baby. Yeah, man, this is a good number here this morning. Come on, you can sit right here if you want to. Come here. Come here. You sit right down here with them. Okay? You want to sit right down? Sit down beside them little girls right there. Okay? Just sit down. There you go. Yeah, let you in. All right. I've been telling y'all, and my goodness, what a good crowd. I've been telling y'all about a, uh, a man named David. was a young man like y'all, became a king. And we've been talking about a lot of his life. Now, how many of you uh, have really good friends? Y'all have some really good friends that you really like a lot. Well, I told you the story of a young man named Jonathan that was a friend of David. Jonathan and David were close friends, and it's good to have close friends. Well, something happened. As they got older, Jonathan and his father Saul were killed in battle. And so his best friend, hey there, buddy. So he had good friend, his best friend's daddy, died. Now, this is significant because of a, another little boy. Now, his friend that died was named Jonathan. Now, when he and David were alive and were best friends, they made each other a promise. Two friends making a promise to each other. Y'all ever make a promise? Okay. And this was the promise they made. That no matter what happens to us, we will be sure that, your fam that our families are taken care of. In other words, Jonathan, something happens to you, I'll take care of your family. David, something happens to you, I'll take care of your family. Well, Jonathan got killed. David did not know that Jonathan had a son. A, a little boy, a young boy, much probably like y'all, maybe even smaller than y'all. And one day after his daddy had got killed, remember he's living in the palace, he's got a maid that looks and takes care of him. Well, when they'd heard that his daddy had got killed, the maid took him up in her arms and she began to flee from the palace with him in her arms. You know what she did? She dropped him. Little baby boy, little boy, she dropped him on the floor of the palace. You know what happened? He broke his feet. He got to where he could not walk. As a little child, he could not walk. So therefore, he could not work. He could not do the things that other little boys did. And he got to where, anywhere he went, when he got old enough to walk, that he had to have some crutches or he had to somebody help him. He never got where he could walk by himself again. That's sad, isn't it? Well, he doesn't know what's about to happen. Remember the promise that David had made to Jonathan? You know what that was? I'll take care of your family. That was a promise. When you make a promise like that, you don't ever know what you might do, but you keep that promise. Now, David one day was walking through the palace and he called one of his servants to him. And somehow or another he got this thought in his mind. I need to help somebody. And so he calls his servant in and he asks him a question. And the question he asks him is this. Is there anyone that I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? You know what he said? 
I want to help somebody. I want to do it in the name of my friend Jonathan. He's a rich man. He's got a lot. He said, I want to help somebody. And he asked, I, I like what the question that he asked. And this is a question, question that we all ought to ask. Is there anybody that I can show kindness to? Right? That's a good question to ask. Is there anybody that I can help? Mm-hmm. Is there anybody I can show love to, right? Mm-hmm. And so guess whose name pops up? The little crippled boy. Now, y'all will never, ever, I don't think, I me rephrase that, y'all surprise me sometimes, ever guess what that little boy's name is? Mabothis. Yeah, that's it. Now, since it's such a long name, hard to pronounce, we're just going to call him Bo. Okay? Ain't that right? Simply down, instead of Mabothis, we're going to call him Bo. His name's like a boat. It's like a boat. That's good. Call him Bo. Whatever. But we ain't calling him Mabothis because I can't hardly pronounce that. But anyway, he comes to him and said, There is one person that needs help. There's a little boy named Bo. Crippled. Can't walk. Doesn't have anything. And you're the king. And so if you got somebody you really want to help, let's go help Bo. Now, I'm going to stop there and tell you what happened next Sunday when David decides to help Bo. Now, remember the question. What can I do? Is there anything I can do to help somebody? Isn't that a good question? And we need to, you know what that's saying? That we need to be thinking of other people and things they're going through. I want to ask you this as we close. This little boy, as he got older, would walk around, could not walk by himself, had to have crutches or whatever to walk. Let me ask you this. Do you think everybody, anybody ever made fun of him? Come on now. Because he wasn't like them. Sure he did. It's easy to make fun of people that may not be like us. But we don't ever need to do that. Because God loves us and God gave us, then we need to try to be kind to those. Whether they're crippled, blind, or whether they're perfectly fine, we're to show God's love to all of them. Yep, see there? That's what I'm talking about. He said one of his friends at school made fun of somebody. Mm-hmm. Maybe just making fun of Right. You know what we call that? Bullying. Right? We don't want to be no bully, do we? Mm-mm. We want to love people, right? That. That's right. All right, let's have a prayer, and then we'll go. What a good group this morning. Yes, sir, Lawson, go ahead. You go pray? That's a boy. Amen. I'm thankful for my friends, my family, and I'm thankful for all God gives to me. Isn't that great? All right. Thanksgiving time. That's a good, great, great, great prayer there. Thanksgiving. Amen. You know what? Look at there. Let me get you next. Here you go. You can get two if you want. 
Get the chewing gum in, sir. There you go. You go, baby. You go, baby. You want to pack chewing gum? Okay. I'll see what you. You go, baby. All right. Here you go. Say the best for last. There you go. One dozen? One's enough? All right. Okie doke. Hey there, sweetie. Hey there, little girl with the curly hair. You want a sucker too? You can have both. That's enough. Okie doke. All right. Go with Miss Anna. She's going to take y'all back there and, and teach you if you want to go with her now. Back there. Thank y'all. Thank you, parents and grandparents, for bringing all these children here. Amen. What's your name? All right. Oh, I think you can get me a coat. Thank you. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. And at the close of the prayer, uh, Mimi will come and lead us in our uh, offertory hymn this morning, The Solid Rock, hymn number 406. Uh, Father, thank you, God, for the privilege of being back in the house of God this morning. God, what a blessing it is to see all these children here this morning. Lord, I thank you for that. And God, I pray that you would bless them and their families. And Lord, as we think of uh, the little boy Mephosbeth, that God was crippled, and yet somebody loved him. God, help us to have a spirit of love in our heart for others, God. Never can always be about us, but it's going to have to be about others. Father, you came and died for the whole world that none should perish. God, I pray now as we come to worship together, as we come to study your word together, that the spirit, that sweet, sweet spirit that we sing about might come and sit down on this place today. And that, God, we might feel the presence of God here. That, God, you would speak to our hearts today. That, God, you would help me to be able to take your word and, God, to say something that would touch somebody's life. God, we thank you as we come into this spirit of thanksgiving. I thank you for all the blessings as we look on this past year. Not only individually, but in our families and in our church. God, you have been so good to us. There's a song by the McCamies that says, you've been so good to me. And Lord, I just want to say thank you for love. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for grace. Thank you, God, for caring when nobody else did. Thank you, God, for sending your son to die for us. God, thank you of the promises in your Bible that we have to look forward to. Thank you, God, for answering prayers. And God, I could just go on and on and on with thank yous today. But I guess what I want to say is, God, thank you for loving us in spite of who we are. Thank you for loving us in spite of what we were. And God, thank you for loving us as we go on through this life. And God, may we have a desire in our heart to serve you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Mimi, you come and lead us in our hymn, hymn number 406, The Solid Rock. Okay.
Church, thank you, Mimi. This time, uh, uh, Wendy is going to come and uh, have our special music for this morning. And then I will come and bring the message on the rise and the fall of man. See, I didn't tell her what I was preaching today. Usually I do. But I said, I'll let her figure this out and see what she sings. And I had a song. There it is. And I picked the uh, the title. A lot of times the titles I pick out don't mean anything. I just put them in there so you have something to read. They literally don't mean much. But I talked today and I put the title down as we're in the book of Hebrews. We're still in the second chapter. I mean, we stayed 
for six, eight weeks on just a few verses, but we've moved on. But I'm going to tell you, uh, Hebrews is not an easy book. It's not easy for me to relate it to you as I try to understand it. But in the book of Hebrews, the writer is trying to prove that Jesus Christ is better than any other method or any other way of salvation that man has ever found. So, when Wendy sang that song, knowing the rise and fall of man, which ain't got anything to do with what I'm going to preach, but it just comes to my mind. John Milton wrote a book uh, many years ago. And in that book, he wrote the story of the creation of man. And he writes the story of the fall of man. The name of that book was Paradise Lost. I'm going to tell you about that because of that song. Later on, four years later, he wrote another book. And he entitled that book, he talked about man regaining and getting paradise again. And he called that book Paradise Gained. So in thinking about that, one of the lines she talked about, that God's going to be with you before you go. And a matter of fact, he's already gotten there before you got there. And he said that what God leads you to, he will take you and see you through to where he's called you to. When God first created Adam and Eve, God put them in the most beautiful place that the world has ever seen. The world has never seen another place like Eden yet. And we'll never see another place like that until the Lord comes back again and takes us up to glory, the most beautiful place that there ever has been or will be. But there was a time, and this goes with the song, that God would come down and walk with Adam. When God and man were that close, and the Bible says that there was a relationship there like there's never hardly ever been since the first part of the Bible in Genesis, where God would come and walk in the evening, talk with Adam, discuss what's going on in the world, and God had blessed them, and life was innocent, and there was no sin, and there was a relationship between God and man pretty much like there hasn't been since then. Now, what happened was this. Man brought about his own downfall. And it all began with a man named Adam. I want you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews, and we're going to move. Now, I stayed so long in chapter 1, stayed a long time in the first four verses of chapter 2, six weeks. So we're going to move to chapter 5. And what we're going to find in these chapters, if I can explain it to you like I want to, how God explains the rise and the fall of mankind. Remember when God created man, you got to understand this, God created him in a perfect environment. There was no evil, there was no sin, everything was exactly like it should be. So in verse 5, would you stand with me please as we honor God with the reading of his holy word, and let's read for a few verses. For, under, for unto the angels has he not put in subjection these words, the world to come. We'll spend some time with that. Put in submission, a suggestion, the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man? that thou art even mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visited him. Thou made him a little lower than the angels. 
Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of his hands, of thy hands. Thou hast put all things, not yet, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him, but now we see not yet all the things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death was crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, would taste death for every man. Let's just stop there. Father, thank you, God, for what you say. Lord, if we're not careful, we'll miss part of this and the importance of it. And God, I'm not sure I know how to explain it as simple as it ought to be explained. But God, I pray that you would help us and that through the Holy Spirit of God, you would talk to us and that we might understand why things are as they are in the world today. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What you see here was the rise and the fall of mankind because of what mankind did in his lifetime. We have a story of a man that had dignity. We have a man that had destiny written all over him and a man named Adam. But as he went along in his life, his life became a tragedy. Out of all the things that God had done for him, we see a man that turned away from God. And from that day to the day that we live in, The sin of a man named Adam has carried on now for several thousand years and has got the world in the condition that it is. It is called sin. Now, if you'll notice something in these scriptures that I read to you here, God never intended, number one, for the angels to rule the world. Never. Angels were never created to do those things. Angels simply were ministers of God that were sent by God that were to do the work of God. Angels' ministry now is what? To take care of us. To get things ready for the Lord to come back again. You see, when the Lord comes back, an angel is going to... Uh, carry a prominent part. An angel is the one that's kind of going to kick it off when the Bible says that he will step out on the clouds and there'll be an angel and they'll blow a trumpet and we'll all go home. An angel was sent to do, but he noticed a term in that Bible where he says in the first verse, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection to the world. So he never intended for them to rule and to lead in the world. Nor, he says, in that scripture, in the world to come. You see, what we see is now, but there is another world coming. And I hear people say such things as this. If somebody dies or passes away, I'll hear somebody say, Well, God needed another angel in heaven. That's a lie. God's got all the angels he needs. When God created the angels, he made exactly how many he wanted. There's never going to be more angels or there ever going to be less angels. Wherever God created angels, they're still angels and they'll be here till the end. That's just the way God made it. But he never intended for angels to rule the world. He never intended, you know, when you read over as we study, as I do on Sunday nights and I study in Protestant, we read a lot in the book of Revelation in the world to come about angels around the throne of God, and we read a lot about angels. But when Jesus, or God, sat on the throne in the fifth chapter of Revelation and said, Who is worthy to take of the book? There was not an angel that had been created by God 
that was worthy to take the book. The book was the title deed of the whole world that could possess, put the world under his subjection. The reason there was no angel that could take that was this. An angel never knew the love of Jesus. He never knew the salvation of Jesus. An angel is just a creature created by God. Oh, we got this picture of them flopping around with their wings up in heaven. And well, when Uncle Joe died, he went up there to bed. God needed an angel. No, he didn't. You ain't going to be no angel when you get to heaven. You wasn't no angel down here. You ain't going to be no one when you get up there. Transformation takes place, but you ain't going to be an angel. But that's what we, you know, I guess that's a a word of, of comfort. And he talks about the world to come. Let me, in studying in depth on this, you know what he's talking about there? And it's amazing. I was asked about this Wednesday night after we got through prayer meeting. Somebody did not understand. Here he's talking about in the world to come. In that prescriptive there, he is talking about the millennial reign of Christ that is coming. That's the world to come. In a world that's coming, and I believe soon and very soon, Jesus Christ will open up the skies, come out of heaven, and the armies of heaven will come with him, and he'll come down to this earth, and he'll take over the world as he lands in Jerusalem, and the Bible says that he creates a new heaven and a new earth. The angels aren't running that, folks. We are. I have this question asked me. me. I had a question asked after services Wednesday night. If someone was going out. Did not understand the thousand year reign of Christ. Are we going to have to, the question was, are we going to have to wait a thousand years? No. We might not have to wait another year. The years of the thousand year reign of Christ, when he comes and takes over and rules the world, will appear after the Antichrist has been, and immediately when he kills the Antichrist and casts him to a lake of fire, then he comes. And not he and the angels take over, but the armies of heaven, those that have been saved, we're going to come down and we're going, what are you going to do for a thousand years? What are you going to do in eternity? Remember, there's going to be a heaven. There's going to be an earth. God's going to have a job for you. What's it going to pre preach? I ain't got a clue. But he says we're going to help him rule, not the angels. What God intended in the Garden of Eden that never happened. So we have God's intention. Secondly, and I have to hurry, we have man's insignificance. We love man, why? Because we are one. But in the grand scheme of God's plans, man is not very important at all. Physically. Physically, he's not important at all. I read this story about man. And the story was this. If you take a man's body and you take that body and you break that body down, physically you break it down, then what happens in this is that if you break all, you want to know how valuable you are physically? If you broke down every chemical that was in your body, sent it off to a lab, and you found out every chemical that was in your body and everything that you were made of, do you know how much you'd be worth? I'm not a scientist, but I read this from a scientist. In the world that we live in today, including inflation, you know what a man's body would really be worth? Less than a dollar. I didn't say that. I read that. I ain't smart enough to figure that out. But in really, in the grand scheme of things, physically, we're not worse much, are we? From dust we came, from dust we're going back to, right? So we're not much very much physically. But then there's another part of man. There's the physical part of man, and then there is the, the mental part of man. Man has become very smart. 
in all my years, and, the, and, are, are, and they're starting to become very significant now, there's never been a time in the history of man that I know of where we come into a field where everything is specialized now. You remember, I remember when growing up, 60-something years ago, that when you went to a doctor, he did everything. If your ear needed fixing, he fixed your ear. If your arm needed fixing, he fixed your arm. If you needed to have a baby, he'd deliver the baby. He would even come to your house when I was raised up. But in a world that we live in today, everything is specialized. Your doctor can't do jack. And I love my doctor, don't get me wrong. But if I got something wrong with my ear, he'd go send me to an ear doctor. If my shoulder hurts, he'd go send me to a shoulder doctor. My knee hurts, he's going to send me to a knee doctor. We have specialized everything to all a doctor can do is tell you what he thinks wrong with you and then send you somebody to fix you. That's what they were. Dr. McFadden, I love you, but that's the deal. Specialize in everything. And we live in a world. I read this too. See, I read all this stuff. It's amazing I remember this stuff. It's amazing I remember anything. I can't remember when I poured a drink to take with me into the living room. My wife has to bring it to me, and I just got through pouring it and sit down while she's shaking her head. Every day, that happened in my life. That in order to keep up with how fast things are moving in the world today, mentally in the world that we live in, this is what it says. That knowledge is changing and increasing so fast that a specialist, would have to read a book an hour just to keep up with his own specialty. I didn't say it. I read it. But that means this. If you've got to see a specialist about anything, don't wait two weeks to see him because he's already 24 books behind if you do. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that right now. That's the reason they don't give you appointment for two or three months because they got to catch up so they'll know what's wrong with you. That's why they call it practice in medicine. That's the world we live in today, and it's supposed to have made us better. So when you think of those things, man not only isn't very valuable physically, but man less a lot desired to be mentally in this age of specialization that we live in today. But man always has had the potential. I believe this. When God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and He placed them in the most beautiful place in the world and God looked ahead and He intended for them to rule and to reign when He created them. God gave man the power to rule the universe. What did he say to Adam? I'm going to put the animals under your feet. I'm going to put everything that I've created, Adam, I'm going to put it in your charge, didn't he? Now the only thing you've got to do is be obedient and faithful to me and you can rule the world forever. That was the rise of man right there. God offered him everything. And the other thing was, not only did God offer him everything to rule the world, God gave him all he needed to rule the world. Son, we live in a world today that is so complicated that the world is falling apart because there ain't enough brains in the world to figure out what's going on in the world we live in today. But yet, that was never the way God intended it to be. God intended it that one man 
would rule and reign in this world for God. But the same thing happened that happens to everybody. Let's see if I can find this in Genesis. Kind of show you where I'm coming from here. Okay. Genesis 1, 26. Rise and fall of man. Just think of this. God said, let us make man in our image, our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. uh, Subdue it. And you will have dominance over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air. And every living thing that moveth upon the earth. In the very first chapter of the Bible, when God created everything, He created man last. And He gave man dominion over every creature, over every living thing. He placed it in man's hand to take care of. And he gave man everything he needed to do the job. Everything. God just asked one thing, and that was what? Be obedient to me. If you'll be obedient to me, you'll rule the world forever. That's what God said. Now understand, as much as God had done all of these things for Adam and in the creation of the world. Not only did man have potential, but man failed. Man failed. The reason that we're in the mess that the world is in today is not God's fault. The reason that we're in the world and the mess the world is in today is our fault. Because if we'd have stayed with God and close to God and we ought to be with God, we'd never be this far away from God as we are today. Because God always intended for that. But when Adam and Eve went into the wilderness and they they listened to Satan, Satan was alive, but listen. This is a story that most don't know. Satan was here before God ever created the heaven and the earth. Satan didn't just pop up somewhere along in the history of mankind. Listen, Satan was here in the very beginning. Because where is the first place in the Bible that we find him at? In the Garden of Eden, Miss Janice, that's exactly right. So he was here in the beginning, along with Adam, along with Eve. And as God had had walked down and, and had come down to them, they failed to live up to what God intended them to be. You ever think of Adam and Eve and think now, God, if I just hadn't took that apple off that tree, if I just hadn't gave in a little bit. You see, all Satan wants you to do is to give in a little bit. He'll never show you the repercussions of sin. Sin always has repercussions. It cost Adam the whole world. You think about that. You may think sin may cost you your marriage. Sin may cost you your job. 
Sin may cost you your family. Sin may cost you your health. It cost Adam all of this. Wife, child murdered by another child, kicked out of the most beautiful place on earth. Do you understand that a bite from an apple caused him to lose everything? And he never feel the potential that God put him in the world to do. And this is what's happening. Now, I'll try to close with this. Instead of having dominion over the universe, this is what's happened. This is us today. Man has found himself powerless over this universe today. Climate change, baloney. Oh, no, rephrase that. Climate change happened, but it ain't my fault. My truck is not the reason we have warmer weather. The reason we have warmer weather is because God makes it warmer. And the reason it gets cooler is God turns the thermostat down. Not because we fly in a jet plane or drive a car or do this. I'm going to tell you one thing. They make all the electric vehicles they want to make and the weather's going to be what God says it's going to be. I'm going to tell you that right now. Man will never understand what he's lost. Because man, because of Adam, has no power to control the... Look back where we started. I want you to go back to what I read to you in Genesis. God, in the beginning, gave man the ability to control the whole universe. You did see that, didn't you? The birds in the air, the oceans, everything. You, it's yours, Adam. If you want it hot, turn the heat. I'm turning it over to you. But Adam blew it. Adam blew it, and because Adam blew it, we live where we are today. That's the deal. That's where we are. Man lost control. Let me tell you something. You don't know how man's lost control. Terry, if you want to go catch a fish, you ain't going to catch that fish unless that fish wants to bite. I'm going to tell you that right now. If that sucker wants to keep his mouth shut, he's going to shut, and you can throw every bait you got out there you want to, but... There was a time when man could control that. You can't control if a bird's flying by. You can't say, bird, go over there and land on that limb. That bird don't give a rip what you say. He used to. He used to care about that. You can't tell that dog, stay out of my flower bed. But if you'd have been Adam and hadn't have failed, you could have looked at that dog and said, Dog, you don't belong there, so don't go there, and that dog would listen to him. We've lost authority in the world because of sin. It's sin. It's always sin. That's what he's talking about here. And man will never understand how much it's lost. Because when God created man, God put him on a lofty pedestal. God set him up high and placed him there. And we'll never understand how easy it was for him to get off that pedestal. Let me tell you something. Satan knows how to work you now. Because the one thing Satan don't want in your life is for you to have joy and peace and happiness and love and that kindness I talked to you. He does not want that for you. He wants you miserable. He wants your marriage strained. He wants your job maybe here today, gone tomorrow. He is your enemy. He started in the Garden of Eden. And then after all these years of living and preaching and being around, and I, I understand Adam. I do. 
Temptation is a terrible force now. And what do we always say about temptation and about the devil? He'll take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. That's what he does. He'll always let you see the good side, but he'll never let you see the outcome. The Bible says that sin lasts for a season. The Bible says that you reap what you sow. If you reap sin, you get sin. If you reap good, you get God. Adam, out wandering, waiting for God to come and visit with him in the Garden of Eden. And guess who showed up? The devil. The devil can come anywhere, anytime, any place. If you don't think he won't come in your life and mess it up, you look at the time he came here in the most beautiful, precious, holiest place God ever made and who showed up? He did. Because he said this. This is God's most precious. This is what he said. This is the best that God created here. He created him above everything was man. This is the best God's got. And if I can get him to eat an apple or a pear or whatever on that tree, I don't know what's on it. If I can get him to eat that. And you know what? As I look about this and I think about this, man, it didn't take much for God to get him to mess up, did it? What did it take? A lie. Eat of this tree and you'll be like God. You mean that that God, that ruined his life and your life and my life. That little simple thing. Eat of this tree and you'll be like God. And mankind failed. So we saw the rise of man, Lord and the angels, but God gave us the ability to rule and to reign. I'm always amazed, and I'll close and we'll have the invitation. The one thing that always amazes me about you and me, mankind, is how inconsistent we are. How inconsistent we are. How one day we can be upbeat, the next day we can be sad. How one day we can be so kind that sugar wouldn't melt in our mouth, and then the next day we can wake up and be just as cruel as a mad dog out there. Man's inconsistencies have always amazed me. Always. That's what got Adam. In this scripture, there's one word that you will note in almost every verse of scripture. And that word is the word glory. Glory. So in coming to the end and closing... This is what this tells us. That God gave man everything that he has needed in life to get it right. It's just like salvation. Simple. Believe and you can receive. Ain't hard, is it? No. The only explanation that I can believe is this. Is that man today is totally lost, mankind, almost as a whole. Because one man sinned. One man sinned. So we saw in the very first 
5, 6. We saw glory given to man when he put Adam in charge of the most beautiful place on the world, a glorious place, and he gave glory to man. But here we are, I'm guessing, and this is a a, a biblical belief for me, um, some 6,000 or so years later, and man has lost his glory. That's where we are. Is the story, listen, where we live today is the story of God's glory being removed from mankind. You see, when you ignore God, and this goes to an individual as well as a people or a nation, that in your life when you decide to ignore God and live as you want to live, do what you want to do, and God never has a say-so in anything, then God will remove his glory from you. God will move his glory from a nation that decides to sin and not obey God. God has removed his glory from mankind because of sin. God will remove his glory from a nation because of sin. Once great and prosperous as Adam and as this country was, we've just been about kicked out the Garden of Eden. We've lost the glory. We've lost the glory. And sin now has become the most dominant part of man's living now. Now the Bible tells us this, that all have sinned and we've come short of the glory of God, ain't we? There's nobody in here today that is not a sinner. So it's very difficult for me to point a finger at somebody when that might have used to have been me. But the Bible says that our God is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins according to his glory. So every one of us stands today as a sinner. We will die in this world and leave this world as a sinner. Now we'll leave this world either dying in our sins or we'll trust Jesus Christ and we'll leave this world getting away from our sins. See, that's the outcome for everybody here. And the thing is, as I tell you all the time, I I choose which way I want to leave. Do I want to live in my sins or do I want to leave out of my sins? I want to leave out of my sins. Well, that comes through Jesus. You know why Adam really messed up? When he asked, when God asked him, remember that day God come down to visit him? And you said, Adam, where are you? You usually meet me right here at this, this bench in the park, and, and you're not here. And Adam's hiding behind a bush, wrapped up in a fig leaf, ain't he? And he lies to God. I wonder what would have happened If Adam had said this, God, I blew it. Man, there was a snake down there got to talking to me. I never had a snake talk to me before, and he promised me this and promised me that, and I listened to what he had to say. God, I'm sorry. God, would you forgive me of doing that? I'm feeling naked now. God said, you are naked. But God still loved him. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll cover you up. 
And the first sacrifice that was ever made in the Bible that incurred blood was when God killed an animal to make a covering for Adam and Eve. And it's still the blood. It's always the blood. Adam couldn't save himself. I can't save mine. But the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. Oh, we've had our glory removed now. Adam, it started with Adam. And here we are some 6,000 years later, and you know what? The glory's still fading away, isn't it? But folks, it ain't over yet. I got a book, and I taught this book when I first came to Southside. Most of you don't remember. I don't. The title of that book was His Glory Revealed. And I used the seven feasts of the Jewish people to reveal the glory of God. And who he was. And as we leave and we have our invitation this morning, I want to say to you, you can still receive the gift of life. You can still receive the glory. God wants you to come to him. Satan will always try to keep you away and never for you to come. Because you see, this is what he knows. If you ever come, he can't ever get you again. If you ever trust Jesus, he's lost you. All he can do is make you miserable, but he can't take your soul. So I'll say as we have our hymn of invitation today, this. Adam made the mistake that affected the whole world for however long it's been. That one sin still affects me today and it still affects you today. But thank God that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Today we live in what I call the age of grace. And I'm thankful that God has let me be in an age of grace. That with all the things I might have done and, and all the things I made that God said he'll forgive us, right? The grace of God cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Oh, we will get to heaven one day if we know Jesus. Not because we washed and cleaned ourselves because we couldn't, but because he did. But I want to tell you something today. Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He'd love to destroy this church right here. He'd love for all about half of these seats to be empty, but thank God. You love Jesus. So as we have our hymn of invitation, just a simple thing, and I can't help any more without closing like this. Sin can keep you out of heaven. But you can deal with sin and get to heaven. You're not perfect. God knew you weren't. But the invitation of the Bible is always the same. C-O-M-E. Come. And I'll wipe it clean. And I'll make it pure. And I want to ask you today. That first scripture I read to you, he used the term, in the world to come. Where will we be, or you be, in the world to come. Different world coming. This is not going to stand. Where are you going to be? That's the question you have to ask. And I want to tell you, God loves you today. And that's the only thing you got to do is say, God, I want to be in that world. Lord, I understand it, but God, I know what I want to be. I know where I want to be. 
And I pray you help me get there and God say, all you got to do is ask. You may be here today and you have somebody that you love that needs your prayers today. That needs to hear. You know, our Sunday school lesson this morning was about being consistent in our prayer lives. People need our prayers today. Paul told them in a lesson, he said, please pray for us. Pray for me. Prayer. There may be somebody in your family, a friend, somebody you work with, you know they're lost. Maybe God's put you here to pray for them. And you know what? Your prayer may be the difference. Because as y'all hear me say all the time, I'm going to tell you why you're saved today. Because somebody prayed for you. Somebody prayed for you. That's how it started. So as Mimi comes to lead us in our invitation hymn, hymn number 320. How is it? Is glory revealed? Has God's glory? Do you have that in your life? Do you want it? You just come. Say, preacher, I don't understand everything you said, but I know one thing. I want to go to heaven. I want to get it right. I want my name written down. Or I might want to join the church, but this is one. I've got somebody I want to pray for today. Whatever God needs you to do. We'll see things from a different viewpoint. We'll look at things different. We'll look at it through His glory and His grace. And I pray that if you hadn't quite got there yet, and you may be discouraged, you know, Satan's dealing with you like he did old Adam, that you will look at the world in a different light. Look at it through His eyes, through His glory and grace. Thank you for being here today. May God bless you. Remember, tonight, 6 o'clock, soup, cornbread, whatever else they have for us tonight, all of you are invited to come. I want you to be here, and let's fellowship together tonight at 6 o'clock. Can we do that? I want you to come back tonight. Mr. Jimmy, would you lead us in closing prayer?